So it's time to talk about the uh, bzip format. And before I do that, I want to go into what appears to be a completely irrelevant aside, which are, here's two pictures of famous people. They had nothing to do with bzip in any way, as far as I can tell. Um, I mentioned this came up at some point earlier in the course uh, that we actually talked about this guy. So this is George Danzig, who was the guy that one day was sitting or, or arrived late to a statistics lecture or something in, in the 1930s, I guess, and saw a bunch of problems written on the board and sort of hastily wrote them down and then took them home. And then after struggling with them for a week, came back and, and said, OK, I've got the solutions to these things. It took me forever, but, you know, please take my homework late. And the instructor of the course said, what are you talking about? These are unsolvable problems. <laughs> I wrote these problems on the board to show that these are problems that we don't think we can solve. And he just went home and solved them. N nobody told him that they weren't solvable, so he went and tried to solve them, and then he did. And it turns out, a couple years later, when it was time for him to write a PhD dissertation, the same person just said, look, put a cover page on those things, and we'll call that a, a, a PhD thesis. And that's, that's just the fantasy of everybody in grad school, I guess, is to end up in that situation. Uh, so the reason I want to bring this up is that obviously George Danzig must have been a pretty smart guy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he, he's sharing the slide today with this guy, who, who uh, unfortunately, you just can't compare people to John von Neumann. It, it's a tough one. And if you came this far in computer science, if you're taking this course, you've probably heard about von Neumann over and over again. Now, he had a bunch of other, he was a weird guy in a lot of ways. He played, apparently he played tennis wearing a suit, and he was quite obsessed with, um, he was involved in the Manhattan Project, and he was quite, he had some pretty reactionary views on how we should use nuclear weapons and things. Um, but the reason I want to bring this up is that uh, one day, so Danzig was later known for um, pioneering a method to solve what are called linear programs. And this also came up when I discussed this in some lecture a few weeks ago, which is a linear program is given a uh, a pair of vectors A and B in a matrix, or sorry, a pair of vectors B and C in a matrix A, uh, I could ask a question like, minimize uh, the dot product of C and X, so, so two vectors with an unknown vector X, such that when I multiply A times X, the result, every element of the result is less than some vector, I'll make this clear, these are vectors, less than some vector b, um, and let's say the values of x are all greater than or equal to zero. So this is an optimization problem. It's called a linear program because as you notice, all of the uh, arithmetic I'm performing is just linear algebra. There's no squares in there. There's no square roots or logs or anything else. So Danzig developed this algorithm to solve these things, um, which is still used today. It's the sort of the workhorse of um, uh, numerical algorithms in a lot of ways, along with other fundamental things like Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. And um, he, at one point he was, he was talking about this method to von Neumann. So von Neumann is one of these people where it just, it, it just scary the amount of uh, apparently his ability to grasp a problem. Danzig came over and explained to von Neumann this algorithm he was working on called the simplex algorithm. And after he explained it for a, for a few minutes, apparently, now this is this is the result of me reading an article on von Neumann, so maybe that's wrong, but apparently the, the lore holds that von Neumann heard about this for five minutes and then said, oh, that, and then began an impromptu hour-long lecture about how it turns out when you look at a problem like this, there's actually a dual problem, which it, Danzig's method ultimately actually relied on. Uh, so you can take a course in this. I've already plugged this. If we ever offer it again, there's a course called CSC 445, which talks about linear programming and dual linear programs and things like that. The problem was Danzig, despite being a smart guy, um, ended up dealing with sort of uh, the, the archetypal example of a smart guy in computer science, an inventor of a huge amount of what modern computer science is, von Neumann, who heard about Danzig's problem that he'd spent months or years on and said, oh yeah, right, sure, and then, you know, just came up with, off the top of his head, was able to formulate this huge theory in the field. And so in five minutes, von Neumann became a pioneer of this field. The reason I bring that up is because I guess it's the old adage that there's always a bigger fish. So we've seen that um, deflate goes to such lengths to optimize compression. And I mean, again, you may be seeing this lecture in the thick of still working on assignment two, where there are so many things to tweak because we're trying to squeeze every last bit out of the process. So deflate is trying so hard to achieve good compression. 
And maybe it's sort of like Danzig here. Danzig was a smart guy. Um, the problem is that uh, you can, even if you're a, a smart guy, if you end up dealing with somebody like von Neumann, like, you know, von Neumann, uh, you can spend years and years working on a problem, and somebody with a brain like von Neumann's can, can take 30 seconds and just solve everything for you. So there's always a bigger fish. And we're going to notice that maybe you can sort of view that as, well, that's not fair. Danzig has been, you know, spent months or years working on this. Why isn't that hard work pay off? And that's, I don't know, a fundamental unfairness of life or something. Um, and we might even think, hey, von Neumann, if he really committed himself to the field, could have, you know, uh, redeveloped the whole thing. If he actually spent legitimate cycles of his time working working inside of any field he chose, he could have contributed huge things to it, which he, of course, did in lots of other fields. Um, but maybe it's not fair that he has to spend so little time. He can be so lazy about it and still get such good results, whereas somebody else, even a smart person like Danzig, has to spend so much time working on these things. And that, unfortunately, is the relationship between deflate and bzip. So deflate squeezes every last bit out. And actually, you know, to be fair, I shouldn't. BZIP's a great scheme. I don't want to compare BZIP to von Neumann. The, the, the compression scheme that goes with von Neumann is probably something that we haven't seen yet, that humanity isn't ready for. But um, the issue with uh, deflate is that it squeezes every last bit out of its input. I mean, there's everything. It jumps through so many hoops to try and reduce the number of bits, so many weird layers of indirection. You turn the uh, prefix code into a code length table. Then you encode the code length table with another code, and you encode a prefix code for that, going to such lengths to make sure that we're saving every last bit. What we're going to notice when we talk about BZIP2 is that really BZIP2's way of approaching storage is pretty lazy. It is full of holes. BZIP2 gives us great compression because BZIP2 is just a genius. It doesn't actually have to spend time on the issue. It doesn't even have to do all of the same cleanup that deflate does. We'll notice that BZIP is full of these sort of, I don't know, inefficiency is the right word, but it's full of these places where they could easily have saved a few more bits, but just didn't. And still BZIP2 often outperforms, or for the most part, we, we treat BZIP2 as a scheme that outperforms deflate. So that's to put us in the right mindset to think about this. As we go forward, we're going to get increasingly infuriated to, to hear about these features of BZIP and think, why does BZIP not care about saving a few more bits? Why is it using an index of 24 bits instead of an index of 20 bits if it can do that? So we'll get more and more frustrating to think about all the ways BZIP is wasting space and still getting better compression. But fair enough, you've been warned. So uh, BZIP came, uh, showed up in the mid-90s, and it's interesting, I, I keep saying BZIP, it's actually formally called BZIP2. And as far as I can tell, the difference between BZIP2 and BZIP1, so there was a BZIP1 that never caught on, and the issue apparently was patent related. So BZIP used, the original BZIP used arithmetic coding as its entropy coding stage instead of Huffman coding. And there are patents, there were at the time patents that were, that arithmetic coding was tangled up in, so people didn't want to adopt something that used arithmetic coding. So we're going to only talk about BZIP2. That's the only surviving member of that family. Um, so uh, BZIP2 showed up in the mid-90s, and and over time, it, it overtook, I think, gzip as the standard um, compression tool, basically because bzip2 is a bit slower than gzip, um, but that became less of a big deal as, com uh, as uh, computers became faster, I guess, and, and we ended up with more memory and things. Um, there are plenty of schemes that are more modern than gzip and bzip, and that, that easily outperform both of them in most cases, but... Um, the reason we still use them. I mean, you might notice you still use .tar.gz for lots of things, even though gzip is several generations behind the, the cutting edge of um, a compression, because we can assume, if you, if you sit down at any Unix machine ever, you can assume you've got gzip on there, and you can these days pretty much assume you have bzip as well. Um, one way that people have charted sort of which compression scheme is the normal one is to try and figure out how Linux, the Linux kernel project compresses kernels. Um, that, and so gzip was used until the, the two, early 2000s, then bzip was used, and these days LZMA is used instead, which sort of, I guess, is a sign that bzip and gzip are now uh, fading into history. Um, we're going to talk about it. We have to talk about the bzip algorithm, the entire process, because we need to see something other than deflate. We are not going to um, go into the detail we went into with deflate. We're going to skip over a lot of those things. In particular, the, the, like the bit fields used in the, in the file format, we don't need to talk about that. Um, we need to talk about it in general, though, because 
we, we know that BZIP is a legitimate competitor to deflate. So we actually have to, we have to study at least one alternative to deflate to know whether or not those decisions were any good, the decisions that the deflate designers made. Is it justified to have a code length, code length code, for example? Um, we'll also notice that there, so it turns out BZIP doesn't do that. Um, there are some similarities. They both use Huffman coding at the end. They both use custom uh, uh, dynamic Huffman codes. Um, so that, that might, uh, I guess, be a hint that the similarities between the two schemes are things that, that the competition, even competitors can agree upon are good ideas. Um, so yeah, the slides are pointing out that we, we're, we have no patience for the full treatment of BZIP. Maybe in some other offering of the course, we'll, assignment two will implement BZIP and we'll do the long lecture about that, but not this time. One thing to note though, an interesting thing is that when we talked about rule number one for um, deflate, there is a rule number one for BZIP and it's strangely the opposite. Everything's pushed most significant bit first, which was pretty annoying when I was writing a BZIP encoder, certainly, after, after writing a deflate encoder. So the BZIP process is a five-stage pipeline. Um, and we know from talking about BWT that uh, BZIP has to do be block-based. It has to um, form a block and then run the BWT on the entire block. I've numbered the stages deliberately starting at zero because the blocks themselves are actually formed after the first stage. So blocks have a fixed size. Now, I mean, they can be smaller than that if there isn't enough data, but the, the maximum size of a block is fixed. Um, and what we do is perform this basic RLE, and then we take the result, which might be smaller smaller or bigger, I guess, than the input, and then group that into blocks. And then from there forward, the, blocks, the, the, the block just works its way through the process. A BWT, then a move to front, then more RLE, and then finally it goes through some prefix code. So what's interesting about BZIP, and I, I've, I've, been I, I've actually brought this up repeatedly so far in the course, is that strangely the compression in BZIP isn't done by the signature feature of BZIP. So BZIP is a package for the BWT and to some extent move to front transformations. Neither of those do any compression. That's not their job. They're, they are size neutral transformations. They take a block of size n and they give you back a block of size n. They just have rearranged it in such a way that maybe it's more convenient to compress. All of the compression happens either before that as a cleanup measure, which we'll see in a minute, um, or afterwards as uh, with a basic RLE scheme, which is you will actually see is a little bit less efficient than the RLE schemes we've talked about so far, um, and by the usual, at the end, entropy coding using a Huffman code. Um, and and that's, that's interesting, that, that actually BZIP is relying on just base, first principles almost to, to do all of the work. Uh, it, it's just that um, it, it manages to transform the data in such a clever way that it gets away with achieving amazing compression with that. So again, we're thinking about Danzig talking to von Neumann here, right? Two very smart guys in the same room, but one of them is just way out of the league of the other one, unfortunately. Um, so uh, as we have seen, this is actually, this is saying a little bit too much. So the BWT result is um, full of these sequences of repeated characters. And uh, it says, as we have seen, this is amenable to move to front. Um, it might, we've seen why move to front is helpful when you have RLE, but maybe it's not obvious from the BWT lecture why that is. So the idea is we know that BWT uh, fits well with, um, a, an, an RLE scheme applied after it because the BWT is going to have a bunch of uh, consecutive identical characters. We also know from earlier, and that's what this is referring to, if you take a look at the, the lecture where move to front was brought up, uh, it was observed that move to front happens to, to link up well with RLE because if you take something full of runs of identical characters and apply a move to front transform, you're going to get a run of zeros. doesn't matter what character you started with, it'll turn into a run of zeros in the result of move to front. So if you apply move to front before RLE, you can often save yourself some work because you only really have to encode runs of zeros, not runs of any character. And that's the key insight in this step here. Um, so RLE is used uh, twice, uh, and there's actually different forms of RLE. The first one, which I'm just going to keep calling RLE1, is what uh, uh, heretofore in the course we've, we've called um, uh, the BZIP style RLE scheme. So that RLE scheme that only encodes a run if it sees four characters that are identical in a row. So here it is. We've already seen this, so we don't need to belabor it too much. Um, what we can see is, uh, let's take a look. Here we have a run of four S characters. There's one, two, three, four, and then a run length, and the run length is zero. And in BZIP2, we actually encode the run lengths into a fixed 8-bit 
value. And this is the first bit of von Neumann logic here. We don't even need to put effort into this because BZIP is so clever. Von Neumann didn't even need to really sit down and think about the problem. Von Neumann, for some reason to him, it just occurred what to do. There was no need to sit down and optimize it. Same thing's happening here. We know already there are all sorts of ways we could be clever with run length encoding. This isn't even trying. It's just doing a basic thing to get the run lengths down. Um, and we'll notice that there's a few reasons why that might be helpful. One of them is that we don't, it's maybe a bit too early to begin doing doing complicated like unary encodings of run links in this process with all the other stages that we have to do. So the advantage of the RLE1 stage is it takes a bunch of 8-bit symbols and produces a stream of 8-bit symbols. Some of those 8-bit symbols are binary values that are run links but it's obvious which ones because they're, they're the symbol coming after four occurrences of the same character. We also have four R characters here and then followed by uh, the number 8 which is the number of other um, characters in the run, the number of remaining R characters. Um, and then we've got the rest of the text. Uh, I think we've got, yeah, a run of four A's and then the number one. So it's a, it's a basically a textbook, like the introductory example of RLE, uh, just with that, that BZIP twist of having four characters before you encode any run lengths. Um, so runs of three or fewer characters are left as literals. This is good because it means that a, an input that is pathologically devoid of any runs of length greater than two isn't going to get inflated too much. But it's worth considering you can still have inflation. We see an example of that here. So there were, or sorry, we, we see an example of that here. There were four S's and no more, and we have to encode this run length and inflate the input size as a result. Um, it's also worth considering that because it, this run length does not include the four characters preceding it, you can encode 255 additional repetitions, and so your runs, before you need to encode four more starting characters, your runs can have length up to 259, so the four initial characters plus up to 255 repetitions. Um, we know already, we, we talked about this, so I'm not going to spend time on it, but uh, we know that this can, if, if we're unlucky, this can still lead to expansion. Um, because uh, we could end up sitting on a file where every, like the file is just a bunch of runs of length four. And if we have that, then every run length is going to get encoded as a zero and waste a bunch of space. Um, so it can, it can still expand the data by 25%. Um, but the advantage of it, we'll see in a minute, is that it, it prevents there being long runs of a single character in the result, which it, it turns out the reason we care about this isn't even compression. It's to avoid a problem with the BWT computation. Um, and so here's something to think about. So here's an interesting point. Uh, the designer of BZIP2, and we have to remember that just like deflate, which is imperfect in a lot of ways in its design, this is not the result of a standard designed by a standards committee or anything else. This is one person, pretty much. Um, and it's a good design. So I'm going to, and the designer has reflected upon this one bit of the design and said it was bad. But I want to make it clear I'm not saying that it was a bad design in general, just that even the designer acknowledges that there was something, some decisions weren't made correctly here. So this original, this first RLE stage, it isn't actually there for its compression benefits. The next stage in the pipeline is a BWT. And we, we, we saw already that a BWT can handle runs of consecutive characters. It's fine. And, and you'll still get the, the benefit of it'll come out of the BWT still looking like a run of consecutive characters, which means you can still apply the RLE to it after. So why are we applying RLE before? Well, the reason is the performance of the BWT algorithm, not the compression benefits. Um, and so Seward has actually said this is a mistake that it was only really added because the implementation, so the particular implementation of the BWT that Seward was using had really bad performance if we saw multiple runs of the same, a run of, a long run of the same character. And I'm gonna try and justify why that was. So um, in, the, in the previous lecture, we talked about the BWT. We talked about the variety of different ways of computing it. And I mentioned um, this would be a complicated Assignment 2 topic in a different version of this course, where Assignment 2 was BZIP. But I mentioned that there's a way of computing a BWT involving something called a suffix array. Um, I don't want to belabor that, but I can briefly describe what that is. A suffix array is a representation of all of the suffixes of some string. So here's all the suffixes of the string. The suffix array represents them in a sorted order. And uh, in this case, I have all these suffixes. I have to now sort them. And uh, if I have a string with a run of consecutive characters, like this one, which barely fits on the slide. So here we have this run of consecutive characters. 
Uh, if we look at where that shows up, this is not the sorted suffix array yet, but it, it, it's just the set of all suff uh, the, the suffixes I get by taking them starting at the end and working backwards. Um, if I take a look at the bit corresponding to those consecutive characters, I might notice that this run of, of suffixes here is already internally in sorted order because they all have a common suffix to each other and they begin with this, a sequence of S characters and so it's actually already sorted. Um, the problem with that is that uh, we, you might know from uh, some past algorithms course, there is a certain sorting algorithm that doesn't like um, seeing its input already sorted. That's, wor that's its worst case behavior. And you'd say, well, okay, what are the odds we're going to use that algorithm to sort this list of suffixes if we know about this problem? Uh, so it turns out that the, the paper in which BWT was originally described, it's actually not like a, a journal paper, it's a technical report from some industrial R&D operation. Um, the Burroughs and Wheeler's paper proposes buried in there somewhere, use quicksort to sort the suffixes to make the suffix array. They're big on quicksort. So I, I almost put this in the slides, but I'll add some commentary here. My impression is that for some reason quicksort was this uniquely like 1980s and 1990s thing um, because I, I, I don't like these days I think people when they learn about sorting algorithms see it from a higher level and, and I mean by now the style of programming people learn these days is such that we don't tend to care as much about the algorithm that we use for sorting until we get into an algorithms course and algorithms course people do not necessarily look so fondly on quicksort because of its worst case time. Um, but I, I think for whatever reason, quicksort was, was a big deal back then. And it might be because uh, of some implementation things. It could be because of a certain like cultural issue. Like basically there was this sense that quicksort was just a great, a cool algorithm. Um, but for whatever reason, Burroughs and Wheeler said use quicksort to sort suffixes. The problem is, and this was a non, like there is the, a, um, the option of randomizing, but a non-randomized quicksort, if you choose the first element of your array as a pivot, its worst case input is an input in which your elements are already sorted, or a large amount of them are already sorted. And so, if you try and sort this list of suffices, and you end up with this subsequence that's already sorted, and think about how much longer that sequence could get if I add more and more S characters, then quicksort behaves badly. Okay, so Seward's remedy to this was what we'll do is we'll add some RLE to uh, mitigate the damage here, to make it so the maximum length of um, a run of consecutive already sorted things is, let's say, four, right? So we add that RLE stage to collapse down these long runs so that quick sort doesn't misbehave. Man, is that a weird idea. So uh, this is premature optimization. So it's an optimization, like, Seward made a decision that permanently modified the bzip2 file format based on the performance of one implementation of an algorithm. So the, the original bzip encoder and decoder used quicksort. That was slow, so the file format was changed to try and mitigate that. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this is problematic, and this is one of the reasons Seward says that, that he regrets this, um, which is that first, in the Burroughs and Wheeler paper, it turns out the next section, after it says use quicksort, says, okay, so quicksort's going to have a worst case problem here, try this trick. It actually provides a remedy that just modifies quicksort to fix the problem. And Seward points this out, like, I'm not sure what Seward's thinking was there, but Seward points this out. There is actually a way of, of solving the problem in the paper. Uh, also, since it's no longer the 90s, I should put in a plug for an algorithm that gets a bit more respect these days than it used to, which of course is merge sort, which doesn't have that problem. It's n log n, which we've, we saw in the previous lecture, that could still lead to some performance problems because in, it ends up devolving to n squared log n. Um, that's still better than quicksort, which would be n cubed, which is, which is pretty lousy, frankly. Um, so it, it, for a variety of reasons, quicksort was a, a cool thing in the 90s. And this, is, uh, this can be seen because if you go back and take a look at programming language uh, standard library sorting implementations, they were predominantly quicksort for a very long time. And that seemed to shift a bit. Uh, I know, like These days, the standard sorting algorithm in most languages is some implementation of merge sort with a couple of tweaks. It's often a combination of merge sort and insertion sort called tim sort, which originated from the Python standard library. So 
So for whatever reason, merge sort was was not um, it wasn't widely used until so, sometime after you know Burroughs and Wheeler or whatever. So everybody used quicksort in the 90s, and as a result of a quirk of the quicksort performance, um, we now have to do this RLE one stage, which is not really the best design. Now on the other hand, Stewart still did a good job. It, it's easy. I mean, hindsight's always 2020. So if we hadn't used quicksort, we may not have seen RLE one here. Now there are a couple of points. One, we could have used merge sort. Why, why should we have used merge sort? Well, quick sort isn't very clever for this. Quick sort has a worst case problem. If I went to John von Neumann and I said, hey, I'm using quick sort for this, John von Neumann would have said, hey, you, you know, you better use this new algorithm I've just invented called merge sort. And he would spontaneously invent a sorting algorithm that works better. It's worth considering that this was in fact invented by von Neumann. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, von Neumann's one of those people, you don't mess with von Neumann. He, he, he invented the, the, the mechanism inside of hydrogen bombs. He also invented merge sort. Um, so if von Neumann was given this task, I think von Neumann would not have had the problem of making the RLE1 stage. Even so, merge sort still isn't as good as we can get. It turns out that since 1996, when bzip2 came out, there have been a variety of new ways discovered of creating suffix trees, including linear time ones. And so if the design had, had foreseen that maybe quicksort wasn't the be all and end all of suffix tree construction, then we would end up with, and, and modern bees implementations do use better implementations of this. Although Seward has pointed out that actually the big O end construction is, has some overhead that isn't desirable. Um, but we're stuck with the RLE1 stage in any case because it's in there and it's part of the format and we have no choice but to use it. Unlike things like LZSS, we are required to encode run lengths for runs of length four or greater. Uh, and just a disclaimer there, I'm not giving Seward too much of a hard time. I've written plenty of code myself that I regret parts of now. BZIP2 was a, success, a massive success, so clearly it did something right. Um, and uh, there are refinements we could make, and it's still worth considering. BZIP2 gets great compression, despite being a bit sloppy in some places, although RLE1 isn't one of those places. It doesn't really create that much problems for compression. It just may not be necessary in general. So in any case, we do RLE1. What comes out of RLE1 is this symbol stream that does not have any more than four consecutive identical characters, which does, I guess, help us if we want to use a sort of bad, like a, a sloppy implementation of BWT. Um, and then after RLE1, we take our symbol stream and break it up into blocks. And as I mentioned in the BWT lecture, this is the one uh, impact of the quality setting. If I do bzip2-1, I get a block size of 100 kilobytes maximum. If I use bzip-9, I get a block size of 900. That's it. There's n those settings have no other impact on compression. Um, and unlike, unlike gzip where dash five or nine or one or whatever has all sorts of, like there's all sorts of tweaks that go into the algorithm depending on how you change the quality setting. Um, so uh, it's also worth considering that because we do the block arrangement after RLE1, the 900 kilobyte block might end up with far more than 900 kilobytes of input data uh, or, or less if it turns out RLE1 expanded the data. So we do a BWT, I'm not gonna, we know how that works. Um, and then we throw the result at the move to front transform. So we have to remember that the BWT produces two things, this, this string of symbols and an index. We have to remember that index for later, but we throw the string of symbols into a move to front transform. And we should know if we, and maybe go back and take a look at the lecture slides from early May, but a move to front transform, if it's given something with uh, consecutive identical symbols, turns them into runs of zeros. So here's an example of that. So here's a string that had some um, runs in it. So there's some S's there. Uh, that's just, yeah, only one run of length longer than four. And we see after RLE1, that run of S's gets encoded like this, where we, we have the four S's followed by a run length. The BWT then goes to work and then creates a lot of nice runs of several characters in a row, uh, even if those runs didn't already exist in the input. Lots of E's in a row, B's, R's. Um, there's two S's, all, and then there's the number three for some reason. Uh, and we can see that the symbol we generated as part of RLE1, it participates in the BWT just like any other symbol. It's, it's just treated as, as an 8-bit value. 
We then apply a move to front transform where these three y's turn into an index followed by two zeros. These three r's turn into an index followed by two zeros. These four e's turn into, uh, I think that's probably going to be this followed by three zeros. And so we get runs of zeros out of all of our runs of consecutive characters um, that went in. The reason why that's helpful is if we want to do RLE on the result of move to front, we can focus on only encoding um, the runs of zeros. We don't actually have to worry about runs of anything else. There could be, I guess, you know, two 11s in a row or something. That that's sort of incidental. That doesn't really have anything to do with the, um, that, 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 that's a, a coincidence, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is what we said, we, as, as we have seen already. We've seen this, we've just seen it in two very different places. The other reason move to front is helpful um, is that in general, uh, if I look at the result of move to front encoding, uh, if I have text with patterns, I will, and I have 256 possible symbols I could see. Because move to front moves the symbol's index, it, it, it gives the symbol a lower index when it's used, um, I will tend to see lower indices in general in text with patterns. Because if I see the same set of characters over and over again, regardless of how they're arranged, they're going to be low in the, or they're going to be close to the top of the move to front stack and therefore have low indices. The reason why that's helpful is if I take this set of symbols and I encode it with something like Huffman coding, um, then I, I can actually reasonably assume that uh, the, there's going to be more stratification of frequencies. So the ASCII value R and the ASCII value A might appear an equal number of times in my original input. But I will expect in general index 0 will appear more often than index 200 in the move to front. Output And so Huffman coding might be able to give me a better advantage of some symbols over others in terms of getting shorter code lengths for more frequently occurring symbols. So move to front has that benefit as well, which, which applies only if the input has some sort of, it, it is contingent on the patterns in the input. Uh, so I, I, I keep the BWT index value and I save that for later. It, it, late, eventually, so past the end of this, when I'm writing my blocks to the input to the output file, which we're not going to spend too much time on, uh, I'm going to write the index into the block header uh, as a 24-bit value. Um, what's neat about this, it, this is the beginning of the sort of von Neumann thinking, you know, off the top of his head and inventing something, the, the way that sort of uh, the BZIP standard was designed. If you think about it, um, the maximum block size is 900k, which means that index only has to be a, a, a value big enough to refer to any whoops, any of these 921,000 bytes. That can be done in 20 bits. I do not need 24 bits for that. And yet, for some reason, I store the block header in 24 bits. I just throw away 4 bits. Um, maybe that was chosen because 24 bits is 3 bytes, so I can get some byte alignment. I, that's convenient, but I'm wasting 4 bits every time I compress a file for all of eternity with bzip2 now. And that's one of the, the first of these infuriating observations. bzip2 gets great compression despite not even trying in some cases, just throwing away bits for the sake of convenience like byte alignment. Uh, so I take the result of the move to front transform and I throw it into a different style of RLE scheme. So that's why they have different names. RLE1 and RLE2 do different things. RLE2 is working on this sequence of indices that came out of move to front. Um, and it encodes sequences, uh, runs of zeros that appear in the move to front output into using RLE. It doesn't worry about runs of anything else. All it works on are runs of zeros. Uh, and it's interesting. This is, I'm calling this an interesting remedy. I'm not saying it's the best remedy. I'm saying it's something we haven't seen before. We've, we've actually spent quite a bit of time meditating on all the different ways to uh, store run lengths, whether we encode them in unary, or actually I think the slides are going to talk about this. So we already initially talked about an efficient way of storing run lengths would be unary encoding. Um, we also, and the reason why unary encoding is nice is that we get a short encoding for short runs, a long encoding for long runs, um, but that the, as a result, it sort of scales well. So if you have a short run, we don't waste too many bits encoding the run length. Um, we also saw that we could do this clever trick where we do use a um, base 2 representation, but we, we obviously want a variable width base 2 representation. Um, and so we, do the, we did this trick in the RLE lecture where we first encode the number of bits in unary, and then we encode um, a base 2 representation using that number of bits. That's a little bit clunky, but I mean, it, it does still, we saw, save us some space uh, because it does give us a nice trade off between having a short run encoded with a small number of bits, but not having a long run use too many bits. Um, these are both viable, 
And uh, the slide is warning us about something that isn't even that big of a concern. But to be clear, the issue with using these here is that we haven't done our Huffman coding yet. And if we generate these arbitrary bit sequences, they can't participate in Huffman coding. Because how do we make enough symbols to accommodate every possible run length that we're going to see? So um, bzip doesn't do this. Now, it's worth considering there's no reason we have to let the run lengths participate in, in Huffman coding. Just like in deflate, where it generates all those length or distance offsets, those are just generated and thrown into the stream. And then we just ignore them. We don't do Huffman coding on those things. We only do Huffman coding on the length symbols or the distance symbols. We just let the, the offset values in binary ride along through the Huffman coding stage. So there's no requirement that, we, that the run lengths participate in Huffman coding. But for whatever reason, bzip uses a scheme that allows the run lengths to be broken up into symbols that then can be sent through Huffman coding. Um, we also, just to point this out, we could talk about the, the similarity, like w whether we need RLE or not. Keep in mind that we didn't have to worry about using RLE in deflate because deflate relies on LZSS, which sort of has RLE built into it. We don't need to add RLE to the end. Whereas here, we have this scheme that doesn't do any compression, and then we have to do something. We have to, uh, RLE is a pretty simple scheme, and then we do Huffman coding. We have to use RLE here because we actually haven't done any compression yet besides the, the most basic RLE in our input. So unlike deflate, which gets RLE for free, uh, we do have to explicitly add it. So it is significant that we find a way of solving this problem. Um, so the, the, the key here is that the RLE2 stage only encodes runs of zeros. And what's interesting about that is that uh, it isn't actually necessary to say that it's a run of zeros. Unlike a typical RLE scheme where I would say something like, okay, there's an A, there's a B, and there's a C that occurs five times. And there's a D, and there's an E that occurs 10 times. I, of course, have to put the character before I put the run length because otherwise, what do I want to run of? In RLE2, I don't have to do that because I'm only encoding runs of zeros. If you see a run length, you know it must be a run of zeros. There's no need for me to encode any zeros at all into the result. So what RLE2 does is it encodes the run length in, in base 2. So it, it, it computes the run length and it, and it comes up with a base 2 representation. But then, so suppose that, that the run length was the number 5. And that's, that's 5. There we go. Um, what it does is it takes this binary value and encodes it into the symbol stream using these two brand new symbols it created called A and B. And I'll, they're often, the specification calls them run A and run B for the sake, because A and B are actual letters, uh, I'm going to call them RA and RB. Um, and so conceptually what it does is it takes a binary value and it encodes it into three separate symbols, which in this case, uh, um, we'll see there's some nuance to this, but as an introductory example, I might encode it as B, which is 1, RA, which is a surrogate for 0, and RB. So it, it takes our binary value and encodes it just by, by expanding it into three separate symbols, one for each bit, and then puts that back into the symbol stream. Um, and because they're distinct symbols, this actually also solves our problem of how do we differentiate, how do we know when a run length is over? So we saw already that the reason we have to use, if I want to encode the run length um, 5 in unary, I have to write it as 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. The reason I get 0 at the end is so that you know that whatever bits come after it um, aren't part of the run length. There has to be some way for you to know that the run length is now over. It turns out this problem isn't a big deal when we have two separate symbols. If you see a sequence, so we'll try this out. So here's my, here's x, here's y, here's ra, rb, ra, z. If you see a and b, these symbols run a and run b, you interpret that as, okay, 0, 1, 0. And the run length is over as soon as you stop seeing our a and our b. So there's no, there's no issue with knowing which bits belong to a character versus which bits belong to a run length. So the run a and run b symbols are used to represent single bits. And I'm going to walk through this progressively because it's not obvious how they get to the, in, the peculiar encoding that they use. So the first one is we, we take our sequence of indices, here it is, and it's full of runs of zeros, hopefully. And uh, then we compute, we figure out the length of the run. So in this case, it's a run of length 8. And we encode that into binary. And that's 1, 0, 0, 0 uh, in binary. And then we take that encoding and we turn it into a sequence of a's and b's. So b, our b functions as the bit 1, our a functions as the bit 0. So 1, 0, 0, 0 would translate into b, a, a, a in my symbol stream. 
And the same thing here, this is 101, so I get B, A, B. And now you're noticing I, I've just taken eight zeros and I've turned them into four other symbols. Uh, but because it's a binary, a base two encoding, I am in general going to say I can encode a, a run of length n in, in uh, log, log base two of n symbols, which is still a savings of symbols. And keep in mind that because these are regular symbols, my symbol set originally had 256 possible values, the indices 0 through 255. Now it has 258 which because I've added these brand new symbols A and B. And they can participate in Huffman coding. So if I see lots of A's, uh, run A in my output, the Huffman code for that might give it a shorter encoding. And so I, I do have benefits I can, I can see from, from this later. Um, so uh, we have this issue that we came up with when we talked about the variable length binary encoding when we talked about RLE originally, which is that uh, if I tell you that you have a four bit number, if I say I'm going to, the, the run length must be stored in four bits. You cannot store it in three bits. If it needs at least four bits, you know that the leading bit is a one. So if you know the leading bit is a one, why would you store it? So in the example, when we talked about RLE, I would first encode the number of bits of the run length, so four, and then I would just give you the last three bits. I wouldn't bother encoding the most significant bit because it's implied to be a one. The same applies here. Um, notice that it's obvious how many bits are needed for the run length because you just count how many RB and RA characters do I see in a row. Here I see four, here I see Three. So you can figure out how many bits you need by looking at that. Um, if, if you can do that, then you do actually know how long the number is, and therefore if you know it's four bits, why do you bother encoding the, uh, the first bit? So for example, if you just had RA, 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 you might look at that and say, okay, that's three things. But I know that if I have three things encoded, it must have been a four-bit number originally. So that means that the leading bit is an implied RB at the beginning. So there's no need to actually encode all four bits, just like we saw in the RLE lecture. There's also the issue that if I have any RBs and RAs at all, then there has to be a run of at least one zero. Why would I bother using RA? Like if this run weren't here, then I wouldn't have any of these. When would I ever need the binary value zero? When would I ever encode a run of zero characters? Well, I, then it never would happen. So I don't want to waste that encoding. If I have an RA by itself, I don't want that to refer to a run of length zero because I'll never see that. I want to have a, but on the other hand, that's a, that's a one symbol value. That's valuable real estate. So what BZIP does is it basically decrements every, um, value. So it says instead instead of a run of length one, which would be, you know, a, a one by itself, which is RB, I encode a run of length one as a zero, which is RA. So the run length that's actually encoded is the run length um, minus one. Uh, and so that's what this says. We don't need we don't need runs of length zero ever to be encoded. Um, and so uh, we do this. This is ultimately the, the same basic logic um, except for the plus one. Uh, that um, is used in the RLE lecture to do the variable length encoding. So what I do first is um, I, I have a sequence of n zeros, and then I compute the position. So this is the index. Let's uh, choose a uh, binary encoding here. Okay, so this is a four-bit number, right? We don't need these leading, these three leading zeros. It's a four-bit number. The position L that I'm computing is the index of the most significant one bit. So there's index zero, index one, index two, index three. So L would be three here. It would not be four. It's not the number of bits. It's the position of the most significant bit. That's why we're using a floor function and not a ceiling. Uh, it's also why the n plus one shows up. Um, notice that the reason this is significant is that if I'm going to strip off the leading bit, like I do it in this scheme here, I have a bit of a problem if I only have a one bit number. I need to make sure that n equals one gets encoded into at least one bit. So I compute this, uh, and this, if you take a look at this, you can observe that this means I'm guaranteed that L will always be at least one. Um, so then what I do is I take uh, my value n plus 1, I subtract off 2 to the L. This is equivalent to stripping off the most significant bit. And then I take the resulting value q and I encode that in binary using rb is 1 and ra is 0. So we'll take a look at the, the modified encoding here. So in this case, if I have n equals 8 um, for my previous value, oh, actually, I guess I should... Um, 
Oh no, I think I talked about that. So if I have n equals eight from my previous value, um, then I have uh, L is equal to three. So eight plus one is nine, and the floor of log base two of nine is three. Um, Q ends up being one. So the issue here is that Q is computed by taking n plus one. So in binary, n plus one is nine, which is one, zero, zero, one, and then stripping off the leading bit. So it just ends up being the value one. Uh, and what I'm noticing here is that there is a um, typo in the slide because it is going uh, least significant bit uh, first instead of most significant bit. So, so in this case, um, this is one zero zero. The, actually, no, that's not really a typo. Okay, the binary encoding is one zero is zero zero one. But to be clear, we encode it with the least significant bit encoded with the first symbol. So in this case, it's 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 like this. One zero zero. Uh, when n equals five, n plus the, the the log in base two of n plus one, the floor of that is two, so l equals two, and then I have this value n plus one is uh, six, and then I strip off the leading bit, and I get the value two. So the binary encoding is just an encoding of q in that number of bits, uh, and then I encode that here similarly z uh, zero one. So by doing that, I, I am saving bits to some extent. So I'm not using like a single zero by itself now means something. It's the encoding for the value one. Uh, and I'm avoiding, uh, I, I'm leveraging the fact that it's obvious how many bits I need because of the number of A's, A and B symbols next to each other. So I can reverse this process using that. So I'm getting sort of the best of both worlds here. I'm getting this scheme essentially, but without the need to store the number of bits in advance because that can be determined by context. Uh, and using this decrement approach, I can avoid having a, a meaningless encoding for runs of length zero. So I try that. Um, before I do RLE2, I have to add this end of block symbol. So RLE2 adds uh, two new symbols to my symbol set. They are run A and run B. And it also adds this end of block symbol, which now has index 258. So run A is 256, run B is 257. The end of block symbol is 258. So I've added the end of block symbol. There it is. Um, and we take that and we apply RLE2 to that. So this run of two zeros here turned into um, a single uh, RB symbol. This run of two zeros turned into an RB symbol. This run of four zeros turned into two symbols. Uh, and then this run of three zeros turned into two symbols as well. And you can see, compared to a, a bit-based um, RLE, this appears to be using more space because a symbol clearly requires more bits than, than a unary representation of, of um, the number three or the number two or something. The issue here is at first we are still saving space. We're, you know, a run of length four turns into two symbols as opposed to four symbols. And because we might notice that RA and RB are probably going to be really common in my result, because as time goes by, we'll have lots of runs of some length, RA and RB will have a high frequency. So when it comes time for Huffman coding, those symbols will get a pretty short encoding. Uh, so I take the result, what came out of my RLE2 stage, and it's interesting because the symbol set I'm now working with is going to contain um, run A, run B, and EOB, which are 256, 257, 258 respectively, but it will never contain a zero because all of the zeros that I had in my original um, the move to front output, all of them got replaced with A's and B's. So my symbol set now actually contains 258 possible symbols, symbol 1 through 258. So we take those uh, that symbol stream and we then encode it with a Huffman code. Before we do that, we renumber the Huffman code. And this is um, this is as close as bzip gets to that that irritating thing that G deflate does where it stores the code length table in a funny in an arbitrary order so bzip2 renumbers all of our symbols to put run a run b and end of block as the first three symbols and then index 1 becomes 3 index 2 becomes 4 and then index 257 um, or sorry index 255 from move to front becomes 257 the reason we do this is actually the same gimmick as what deflate does, which is that if you only have a small number of symbols in your um, move to front input or output, it's like suppose your file just contained, I'm not going to use A, B, and C, if your file just contained X, Y, Z, X, Y, X, Y, 
ZZX or something, if it only contains three different symbols, then you're only ever going to use the first three move to front indices. Almost all of the move to front indices will never be used. And so if you develop a Huffman code, many of the bottom entries of this uh, table will never actually get an encoding. And so the reason we reordered them is we can be guaranteed this will always appear. There's always going to be an end of block. And we want the ability to say, hey, only store the first bit of my code length table. So, so if we reorder it this way, we're increasing the likelihood that I can throw away a certain number of entries at the end of my code table and just not store them at all. Um, so, and this is, this is pointing that out. So the way we initialize um, the stack for move to front encoding is we figure out the, the set of distinct characters in the input data. So there could be fewer than 256 possible symbols in the input data. We, figured out, we figure out which symbols actually appear and then initialize our move to front stack to that set of symbols. And the symbols are initialized in order. So, so if symbol 0 appears, it'll, it'll be uh, um, closer to the top of the stack than symbol 10, for example. Um, and so uh, because of that, if I only use a certain number of indices, I could just avoid storing the parts of the code length table, the, the, the last bit of the code length table, the suffix of it that consists only of zero lengths. Um, one other question to think about is, uh, obviously, if I give you a file with 8-bit values, it's possible that many of those 8-bit uh, bit sequences never appear. So I give you a file full of ASCII text, you probably will not see the character with ASCII value 9 once or, or ever. Um, the question is, is the same true of move to front? If I use move to front with a stack of n symbols, and I've guaranteed you already, so I, I make my move to front stack, um, I'll use that same example as before. Suppose I know my file only contains x, y, and z. So I initialize my stack for move to front to contain x, y, and z and nothing else. Um, so I give you a stack with n characters in it, each of which I guarantee is in my input at least once. Is it possible for one of those indices, so I've got index 0, 1, 2, is it possible for one of these to never appear in my result from move to front? So that's one thing to think about. It's one thing to really give some thought to before July. Um, so in any case, I develop a, co a Huffman code for this, this uh, set of symbols here. And then I have to store it somehow. And we're, we're, we have to talk to some extent how it's uh, being stored. But before I do that, the code lengths are limited to 20 bits, not, not 15 like deflate. I generate the codes themselves using exactly the same algorithm deflate uses. I actually think that the bzip document actually says refer to RFC 9051. It actually says to go look at the deflate standard to determine how to generate the codes from the code lengths. Um, we're not going to see a lot of this, so let's make sure we don't get the wrong impression. The block header logic for bzip is just as weird as deflate. It's just weird in different ways, and we're not going to talk about a lot of the weird things about it. We shouldn't get the impression that therefore deflate's, deflate's logic is unnecessarily convoluted and bzip's is clean. No, not really. They're just different types of, of um, convoluted. So we're out of patience for that, so we're not going to talk about it. We are going to talk about some key uh, features, some, some, imp some particular choices that were made. Some of the things we are not going to talk about is, are the fact that each block is actually allowed to have different Huffman codes. I can define several Huffman trees for one block of data, and I can add logic to switch between them at regular intervals. So, um, and the compressor gets to decide. So that if I, for example, notice in my 900k block or in the, the move to front output that certain patterns uh, vary as the block goes on, I could define two different Huffman trees and then switch between them. The logic in the block header for doing that is extremely weird. Like it, it, it um, there are several places in the block header where we store a bunch of data we don't even need to store because it's obvious. It's implied by other bits of the um, block header. The other thing is um, a bzip2 file like a gz file is full of different blocks and at the end of it, it has this one big CRC value. Unlike deflate, each individual block also has a CRC value stored. So a four byte CRC is stored in every single block in addition to a, a big one for the whole file. 
this is sort of helpful, I guess, because it means you can figure out if you have an error in your file, which block contains the error. But it is also going to use up a pretty decent number of bits. Uh, and then the magic numbers used by every part of the file, so the file, the one at the beginning of the file, the one at the end of the file, and the one at the beginning of each block is 48 bits long. So it's six bytes of magic number. Um, and compared to deflate, which uses what, like two or three or something. So you can see there are lots of places where bzip is just throwing bits away. Uh, 48 bits for every block header. Um, so that's that's fine, whatever. We're not going to talk more about those. That this is, you know, we don't get we don't want to get to the bit level block encoding issue here. So uh, just to keep the, to to wrap things up, uh, to to actually do decompression, what do we have to know? Well, we have to be able to undo the the Huffman coding. Certainly, we need the code length table, obviously. Um, we also need to know. Um, it's talking about slide 48 here. What we need to know is how much of this code length table do I actually have? How many symbols do I actually need? Because I'm not going to store the code links for the ones that I don't need. That's the second to last bullet point here. The number of distinct symbols that actually appear in the RLE2 result. I also need to know um, when I did my move to front, I had to initialize my stack. And the stack gets initialized to the set of all symbols that actually appear. And move to front is operating on the BWT output. So it's the set of all symbols that actually appear in the BWT result. There could be fewer than 256 possible symbols in the BWT result. So I need to know which ones I kept. And if I only have like three symbols in my entire result, then that's going to make move to front generate only a few indices, which is useful. But I need to know which three symbols those are. Um, and so I have to store that somewhere in my block header. And then finally, I have to store the BWT index to allow me to reverse the BWT. So what do I want to talk about? Well, as far as the code length table, we do have to, there's only one quirk we have to review there. Um, the this value and this value are not, I mean, who cares? That they're, they're single numbers. Um, but I actually want to talk about this. So there were 256 possible symbols in my input file. Suppose fewer than all of them are used. Suppose I only use 10 different symbols. That's great because it means move to front now has a stack of size 10 and will only generate 10 different indices. But then how do I tell the decompressor which 10 symbols I use? I need some efficient way of doing this that doesn't expand the data too much if I use lots of symbols. So one, example, one thing I could do is I could just tell the decompressor, OK, I use five symbols. I store this in eight bits. And then I just give each symbol, A, C, D, E, F. OK, so each of these is 8 bits. The problem there is that if I give you a list of symbols, then uh, if I use a large number of symbols, I'm wasting tons and tons of bytes telling you all of the symbols that I use. The other thing is you might notice, I don't care what order you tell me the symbols. I just want to know what are all the symbols you use. Let's agree that we'll treat, we'll always have them in ascending order. So there's no real need to have them listed in a, like a, an explicit list like this. So I would like to be able to tell you in as few bits as possible which symbols out of this set of 256 possible symbols I actually use. So what I'll do is I will, for each symbol, this is listing the values for, the, for, for symbols 0 through 63, but the, you can see what would happen. The table would be four times bigger for, for 256 symbols. For each symbol, I make a bit, uh, a bit field. So I make this bit array of zeros and ones. And the, end, and the question is, does the symbol appear or not? So symbol 0 does, symbol 1 does, symbol 2, 3, 4, and 5 do not, symbol 9 does. These three do, none of these do, and then these three do as well. So I just make a, a bit field for whether each symbol appears. Now I have 256 bits. I could just store this. 256 bits isn't that bad. Um, but uh, so that's that's uh, 32 uh, bytes, or sorry, no, 356 bits would be 64 uh, bytes. That that's not that's not great. But uh, no, wait, it is 32. Okay, let's let's just work through this. 256 divided by eight equals 32. So that's how many bytes 
I would have. I shouldn't second guess myself. Um, there are, so if I store this bit vector, this entire thing, for all 256 symbols, that's 32 bytes. Which, if it's a big block full of lots of different symbols, 32 bytes, I might have to put up with that. But my issue is, what if I have a block that contains only two distinct symbols, and the vast majority of these things are all zeros? Do I want to waste 32 bytes? Especially if the block might actually be really small. Like, what if the block only contains uh, 100 characters? 32 bytes is a lot of overhead for that. So to do that, I actually d d use some indirection. What I do is for each group of 16 symbols, I make a second field which just tells me yes or no, were there any symbols present in this group of 16? So here there was a symbol present, well there were three symbols present, so this is a one. Here there were four symbols present, so this is a one. This, this row had zero, so it's a zero. And this row had three symbols present, so it's a one. So now I have a bit vector of 256 present values plus this bit vector of um, 16 different, uh, so it's, it's each uh, of the populated values goes with 16 bits, 16 symbols. So I will have 16 of these zeros and ones. Uh, and what I can do is I can observe, if I tell you whether each row is populated in advance, if I tell you, okay, so um, the first row was populated, the second row was, the third row wasn't, the fourth row was, what I could do is tell you that, and then I could say, I'm only going to give you the actual present vector for the rows that had a one. So I can, I can store this vector, this vector, not store this third one, and then I store the fourth one. And so the idea there is that uh, I, I'm getting a trade-off between storing all 256 bits um, but still being able to represent all of them if I need to. Uh, and so I just group them into blocks of 16 and then I just set a bit to 1 or 0 based on whether that block has any 1 bits in it. And then I store my 16 population bits all in a row, followed by 16 bits for each row that was populated. So I completely omit rows of all zeros. And that means if I have a very small number of symbols, that I'm going to be able to omit lots of things. I won't be storing all 256 bits. Uh, and so this just walks through that. Um, what's interesting about that is if I have a pathological case like a single one in each uh, vector, then I still have to store all 256 bits. I have no way of optimizing rows, uh, runs of, of zeros inside of a row. I, I, I just either have the row or I don't. The other thing that's interesting is if, as I would expect to be the case in a pretty large and you know binary file or something, if every possible symbol is present, then this, this scheme just wastes space. If every, if every symbol is present, then every single entry of every single row is a one. So I end up storing 16 population bits plus 256 uh, of these present bits. I have to store all of them. And they're all just one bits. Every symbol is present. So I, I get nothing out of this scheme if that happens, which could be a bit of a waste. I've just wasted 272 bits on a case that is pretty likely to occur on some large files. If you give me 900k of data from a large file that's a binary file, I may well see every symbol or every symbol but one. And I've just wasted 272 bits telling you that, that this file might contain every possible symbol. And so it's another place where maybe if we were more clever, we could optimize this a bit, but bzip2 doesn't. So bzip2 is able to achieve great compression despite just throwing bits away left and right. OK, so what about the code length table? So I've generated this code length table. And maybe I don't need to store all of it, but suppose I do. So here I've actually, uh, I've actually um, uh, generated a table that actually has a length in its last position. So I store the code length table using a delta compression scheme. Uh, so I, I don't use deflate, of course, encodes the code length table with a different code. We don't do that. We take the code length table and we encode it using delta compression. Um, it's this scheme. So we store the first entry of the table as a, an absolute value in 5 bits. So the code length is at most 20, so 5 bits is enough. So I store the number 3, and then I store a um, sequence of these delta values. So I would store, uh, I just output bits based on this. So either 0 to stop, 1, 0 to add 1, 1, 1 to subtract 1. So 3, and then I would do a 0 for, this is 3. I just store that as, actually, let's write that out as a proper binary value, so most significant bit first. This is just 0 for stop. OK, now I have to add 1 um, 16 times. So 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0.
you can always fast forward through it if I decide to actually do this. So I, I just encode these delta values to sub add one or subtract one. Now that's, um, if you think about it, if I just stored the value 19 in five bits, it would be way, like I've wasted so many bits doing this. Um, but maybe that's a good scheme because we're not likely to have too many cases where, you know, symbol one has length three and symbol two somehow has length 19. That's pretty unlikely, and we shouldn't optimize for that. We're probably more likely to see things like this. We see a six, then a five, then a bunch of other fives, then an eight. On average, unless we've got an incredibly skewed distribution where we're likely to get good compression just by doing Huffman coding at all, if we have an average distribution, the code links won't be too different from each other. So we use this scheme, this basic delta compression scheme to encode our values, to encode each, uh, we, we, after the first value, to encode each other value as a delta. And I call this a basic delta compression scheme because it is literally our very first attempt from the delta compression lecture. We had this lecture on delta compression where we spent an hour and a half talking about delta schemes and something like half an hour in, we came up with a first try that was this very basic scheme. And by the end of the lecture, we had come up with a much more advanced scheme that was way more robust that also saved a whole ton of bits. And yet, for some reason, BZIP uses this, uses the first try scheme. And that's it. That's all it does to encode this code length table. Um, and it doesn't, didn't take us very much logic. During the lecture, we were able to, by, you know, through the Q&A, people had good ideas for improving this scheme, and yet BZIP doesn't use any of them. BZIP just does this. It just keeps the basic inefficient scheme. And that makes sense, because, you know, BZIP is the kind of thing von Neumann could have thought up in 10 seconds, and von Neumann wouldn't have thought about all this little op, well, maybe he would, I don't know, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to sell him short here, but, um, it's the kind of scheme that is so clever that it doesn't need to do any of this stuff because it can achieve great compression anyway. And so there's so many avenues to optimize it far beyond what it's already doing for things like small inputs. Now, to be clear, the reason BZIP can get away with this to a large extent is that all of this overhead is only a few bits here or there. The code length table taking up three times as much space as it would otherwise isn't great. But if the code length table is still taking up only um, I don't know, a thousand bits or something, that's 1K out of 900K. The, the format is able to compress that 900K block so well that even an extra 1K of overhead isn't necessarily the end of the world. It's still strange that we have it, but uh, it, the, the format is so good that it's able to mask off a lot of that overhead. And if we remove the overhead, we likely wouldn't be improving the compression ratio by that much. We would, however, be able to optimize things like small inputs, where the overhead can, in some cases, overwhelm the compression advantage um, that you get with BZIP. Keeping in mind that, unlike deflate, every block in BZIP is of the same type. There, there is no option to use, let's say, block type 0 or block type 1. You have to encode everything using RLE1, BWT, move to front, RLE2, and then generate a Huffman code for it. And it turns out that one of the reasons why that's not the end of the world is, odds are, if you have a small block, then uh, you're likely not to contain very many distinct characters for a pretty obvious reason. If your block has size 10, there's no way you're going to have any more than 10 distinct characters, which means you're not going to need the vast majority of your length table, and you just don't store it in that case. And you only store a length table of length, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 13 to include run A, run B, and EOB, and that length table, even if there is some overhead, is only 13 things, and so you save some of that overhead. Unlike in deflate, where your length table could still be really long, you still have a length table of length at least 256 no matter what you're encoding because unlike um, BZIP, deflate doesn't do move to front encoding where it mashes all of the symbols up against you know, the, the, the first few indices. And you only need larger indices if you actually have more symbols appearing in your table. So the reason we talked about those last few things uh, were to indicate first that we don't actually have to be that clever. BZIP, again, is successful. We don't actually have to be that clever um, to achieve good compression. And the reason we should know about these techniques, like using delta compression for the code length table or this built bit filter approach to store which symbols are present, is that on assignment three, you might want to use some combination of these, maybe make it more efficient, um, in the blocks that you create with whatever format you come up with, where you, you obviously don't want to use deflate again. Um, you may not want to use BZIP, but you might want to cherry pick little bits of BZIP to, um, to feed into whatever scheme you actually end up coming up with.